And I want to, just want to let the audience know that we'll be starting in about one minute. Wait for everybody to uh, log in and then you're going to learn everything you wanted to know about apprenticeships. All right, let's get started. Good morning, everyone. This is Morning Scoop, and I'm Gary Grotto, the executive editor of the Arizona Capital Times. And today is our annual Morning Scoop, where we discuss apprenticeships in conjunction with National Apprenticeship Week. And we're going to talk about their importance to the construction industry, workforce development, and the economy. And sponsoring today's discussion is the Arizona chapter of the National Electric Contractors Association. NECA is the voice of the $225 billion electrical construction industry that brings power, light, and communication technology to buildings and communities across the U.S. NECA contractors are the technical professionals responsible for the most innovative and safest electrical construction in the United States. And joining us today are three gentlemen who know a few things about apprenticeships, and I'm going to introduce them one by one. And they're going to tell us a little bit about themselves and their credentials and so forth. And um, I've offered, uh, I've asked them to offer some opening remarks if they wish, and then we'll move on to our discussion. And first, we have Sean Hutchinson, and he's the training director for the Phoenix Electrical JATC program. Good morning, Sean. Morning, Gary. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Sean Hutchinson. I'm the uh, director here for the uh, for the Phoenix Electrical JATC apprenticeship program. Um, I'm a member of the uh, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, IBW Local Union 640, and a product of this same program. Uh, it really is uh, the entirety of my post-secondary education. And um, I graduated from this apprenticeship uh, back in 1995, and I've been attached to this program really ever since. We started teaching here um, immediately after graduation in 1996, and uh, I've served in many different capacities and in, 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 you know, supporting this this training program uh, from instructor to uh, to trustee uh, to you know, to uh, to committee member, and uh, took this job um, back in 20 at the end of 2012, beginning of 2013 uh, to. Uh, uh, begin this journey of uh, basically growing this program and providing the services to our NECA contractors um, across the uh, across the Arizona, you know, most of Arizona, essentially. Um, so uh, look forward to the discussion today. Uh, there's lots to talk about, obviously, today with apprenticeship training and its impact on the overall economy and uh, basically getting uh, keeping Arizona moving forward. Great. Thank you. Uh... Sean. And from the Arizona Public Service Company, we have Dennis Anthony, and he's the Manager of Technical and Safety Training for the Transmission Distribution Operations Support Department for the company. And he's also Chairman of the Arizona Apprenticeship Advisory Committee. Uh, good morning and welcome, Dennis. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Um, I, too, share a similar history with Sean. I completed my apprenticeship at the Phoenix Electrical Joint Apprenticeship Training Center in uh, 1984, started in 1980. I have about 43 years experience uh, in the industry. Also, uh, I was director of that program from 1999 until 2008. I then moved on and managed the apprenticeship programs at Central Arizona Project. And about 13 years ago, I moved to Arizona Public Service and I manage four apprenticeship programs there. We have lineman, substation electrician, polyphase meterman, and heavy duty mechanic uh, apprenticeships uh, that we manage. Likewise, I'd like to mention that Arizona Public Service Generation 
division also has their own apprenticeship programs and Palo Verde Nuclear Generating Station, another branch of the company, uh, they have about a dozen of their own unique uh, apprenticeship programs. So Arizona Public Service is heavily invested in, um, in apprenticeship programs. Uh, I, in addition to serving my apprenticeship, I also have a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University. And I'm also a member of the Workforce Arizona Council. And I'm also, as with Sean and Carlos, I'm also very actively involved in the Build It Arizona initiative that hopefully we're going to talk a little bit about today. So thank you, Gary. Thank you. And we are going to be talking about it. And so um, our last uh, panelist is Carlos Contreras. He's the director at the Office of Economic Opportunity. Good morning, Carlos. Uh, good morning, Gary. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And it's a uh... It's a real pleasure to be uh, on stage with uh, these gentlemen. Um, uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the, the CEO for uh, the Office of Economic Opportunity. Um, Dennis mentioned the Arizona Workforce Council. So that's uh, an entity that our my team manages, as well as the Build It AZ uh, initiative that we'll talk about, which is really around uh, how do we double the number of uh, construction apprentices by 2026? And you know, our focus uh, on particularly on this on this type of initiative is what well, we see. You know, big demand in in construction jobs over the horizon. We also see really great paying jobs, uh, pathways that are working that are very successful with the folks that have built these programs over the years. And so we're uh, we're very you know, op optimistic that we can hit uh, doubling because of the work that uh, everyone in this ecosystem has done. And we'll talk more about that. All right, thank you, Carlos. So um, just wanna remind our audience that um, we do have the chat open. And if you have any questions for anybody, please uh, submit the questions. Um, we just ask that you uh, not talk amongst yourselves, um, you know, if, if, and, and just use the chat just for uh, submitting questions. So um, we'd really appreciate that. And um, our best questions always come from the audience anyway. So um, moving on, um, you know, we were talking yesterday about all the construction that's going on and depending on where you get your data, you know, Arizona is anywhere between the fifth to the eighth fastest growing states. And, you know, all you got to do is just go for a drive. And, you know, my drive from Gilbert, you know, I pass warehouse, big warehouses under construction. I go past the Broadway curve. We can see all the overpasses under construction. Went up to Flagstaff the other day, and that's under construction, I-70, I-17. And then, of course, downtown, there's buildings all over the place. So, um, Sean, you know, where, where do the apprentices fit in with all this activity? Well, the growth that you mentioned is definitely reflective in the uh, demand for, um, you know, construction workers overall, but in particular, apprentices now um, training to become highly skilled workers in their, uh, in their field of study. Um, today, the, the, the program is, is much, much larger than it's ever been in its, uh, in its history. Uh, over 80 years of, uh, of you know, providing apprenticeship training to the electrical industry, um, we've never seen the numbers that we see today and in the, in, you know, quite, quite frankly, forecasted into the future. Uh, so, it, you know, the apprentices themselves are experiencing uh, high demand. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity right now in the construction industry for all trades, including, you know, particularly electrical trade has been a, a high demand industry, um, you know, not just because of the buildings being built, but infrastructure and uh, energy related, pro uh, you know, um, uh, projects that are that are just, you know, the, the future is just um, not, to, <laughs> not to be uh, create a pun over, but it's very bright for uh, for electricians and uh, um, and yeah, it's. Like, like I said, it's really, really good opportunity for these kids today to, to, to get in, involved in a trade, train correctly through an apprenticeship path, and, um, and prepare for a, a really good, secure career for their future. Uh, so, Dennis, why, why did, would a 19-year-old guy want to, you know, join an apprenticeship program? 
Um, well, I, I can share a little bit of maybe my own past for that. Uh, and I think a lot of people probably find themselves in, in a similar situation. Uh, for me, I grew up in a, you know, a lower middle class, blue collar family. Mom and dad both worked. Uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to go to uh, college or anything right out of high school. Uh, you know, and looking at it, I had uncles who went through the uh, Phoenix Electrical Apprenticeship Program. And they kind of, you know, talking with them and working, uh, you know, on their homes as they built homes and stuff. I became very interested in it. and. Uh, went through that apprenticeship program and it became my uh, ticket to the middle class uh, because there weren't, you know, the, the economy wasn't great then back in 1980, 81, 82. Uh, so, you know, trying to find a job that paid good sustainable wages and had some benefits so I could have some health care. I wasn't covered by my, you know, my parents' health care. Things were vastly different uh, then than they are now. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of my ticket out and I was able to, you know, move out, be independent, have my own apartment and, and eventually, you know, gaining my journeyman ticket, uh, I went back to college and then I, I made the money myself to raise a family and, and go to college myself. Uh, so that's what interested me. And, and, you know, honestly love the work, love the benefits and love the camaraderie. Uh, of the local union. I'm still a dues paying member of IBW local union 640 as well. Uh, even though I'm in management uh, for a utility, uh, I've just always paid my union dues. I, I see it as a, as a, a way to give back uh, and it, and it's a great organization and I, I will support it uh, my entire life. So let's get back to the, the, the 19 year old today and you're trying to convince them to, to come into your program? What do you, what do you tell them? So uh, I'm going to speak generally as opposed to our specific program, but generally I think uh, the same things, right? The wages are really good. Uh, the working conditions, you know, it is very hard, hot work, uh, but there's a payoff and the benefits for their families. A lot of these young guys now they have, uh, they have families that they have to support. And I say young guys, but young, young men and women as well. Uh, there are a lot of women in the apprenticeship programs now, and they have, they have children they need to provide medical care for. And they're also looking for a sustainable future. As we look at retirement and you look at some of the things going on with uh, potential changes in social security, uh, most of our traditional apprenticeship programs, we still offer a really robust pension plans. And uh, that is something to look forward to the future. A lot of young folks don't think about that, but I'll tell you when they get into their forties, they start thinking, wow, that was a great decision that I made 20 years ago to go into the trades because now I have a way that I can retire and I don't have to work until, you know, I physically am and I'm unable. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I just think there's a lot of recruiting. It's interesting work. There's a lot of it. Uh, the training is good. It is your ticket. Uh, still, it is your ticket to the middle class. Uh, and it's way better than a, than a career in retail or something like that. And I don't want to, I don't want to denigrate those careers or anything, but the wages that you will earn uh, after serving a registered apprenticeship, uh, they are substantial and the benefits are equally substantial. Uh, so those are the things that I really, you know, recruit people to. You know, so oh. you mentioned the oh, sorry, Gary. The, no, go uh, ahead, Sean. You mentioned the nineteen-year-old, the, the the college, you know, the high school graduate. I, I just wanted to add to Dennis's comments about, you know, the fact that um, you know, graduating high school, they are bombarded with, um, you know, uh, the college machine, if you will, uh, the of recruitment, and um, you know when you consider apprenticeship as your post-secondary education, you are looking at um, not going into debt like you would going into college and doing the work of your field of study. Uh, I know my kids have gone to college and they, they, they go to college, they learn their field of study. And then after they graduate, they look for their initial job and it's usually entry level and it's nowhere near the, the, the wages and benefits to support even the, the repayment of their, their student loans. Um, when you go to an apprenticeship program, there is no student loans. 
there's college accredited education with the the wages and benefits of your field of study. So you are you are earning as you're learning. And, you know, instead of going into debt, tens of thousands of dollars, uh, by the end of four years in an, in an electrical apprentice, our electrical apprenticeship in particular, um, the wages, the wages alone, gross wages alone equate to over two hundred thousand dollars of gross income over four years, as opposed to tens of thousands of dollars in debt and no job. So, Carlos, what's the the state's role in the apprenticeships? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Gary. Um, well, first of all, the, the state houses the the apprenticeship office. So any any uh, apprenticeship that wants to get registered has to go through through the state process. Uh, so that's that's one role. Um, the the other role uh, with the Arizona Workforce Council is to just kind of you know lay out a strategy in terms of where what programs uh, where's the growth, uh, where do we need to uh, invest federal workforce dollars, uh, and uh, this is where you know build it AZ came in is because this is a uh, an industry that needs more workers. Uh, it's also kind of an industry that's in the middle of everything that's going on right now in Arizona, right? Whether it's semiconductors. Uh, infrastructure, roads, uh, advanced manufacturing, right? Any anything that's going on in uh, in Arizona from an economic development perspective involves construction. So this is uh, kind of a critical industry for to continue uh, Arizona's growth. Um, and so our our role really with Build It AZ has been to uh, get all the all the stakeholders together, and and uh, for, you know, governor is very interested in. Uh, how do we build a, an economy uh, for everyone, right? How do we provide jobs that are open for everyone and Arizona for everyone? And and so when we look at uh, construction and in your question around how do we get students interested in this, uh, this is one of the topics that uh, came up in our build at AZ. We've actually uh, set aside um, half a million dollars to to uh create a, a social media campaign so we can get more people into this industry uh and uh i think it's very exciting when you can see what you're actually building and you can look around as a as somebody that it's in this industry and can point to specific physical things that you worked on that you actually built uh, uh i think people uh, are attracted to that right uh uh, as well as kind of seeing themselves uh, as as Dennis and Sean talked about, like the the path for our middle class that these jobs have created, not just now, but have always created. I think we've kind of forgotten about that over over the period of time. And and uh, you know, having worked in industry, trying to get uh, one of my previous jobs, trying to get students interested in engineering. You know, the question that you always in STEM careers, it was always like, well, why do I need to learn this? How am I going to apply it? And, you know, apprenticeships are just, especially in construction, are just wonderful examples of you learn and then you apply. Uh, there's really not a lot of a lot of uh, slack there in terms of what you're learning versus what you're you're applying in, in, in every in every day, uh, in, in your everyday job. So I, I think for us, the challenge is to reach those populations, uh, to paint the picture of what kind of career, what kind of life you can have, as well as you know how you're basically you know transforming Arizona into into uh, economy into with all these big projects that are going on. So, um, I, I read something yesterday about uh, the Build It AZ and um, five hundred thousand dollars is going to grants, right? Did you just say that five hundred thousand is also going to um, promotion? And yeah, are yeah. Two so, separate... yeah, so we have there's there's we put additional so we had a work group and we came up with uh, 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 some more specific targeted areas. So you're, you're, you're correct, Gary. There's an initial half million that was there originally that's still there around for capacity building. So, you know, building out pre apprenticeship programs, pipeline programs. How, how do we get uh, students interested earlier? Right. Even going going down to middle school uh, in terms of when students start thinking about what kind of careers they want to have. But we also set aside half a million dollars for uh, a marketing campaign and looking, we have a lot of partners, industry partners, uh, trade partners that want to provide content so that we can highlight, this is what you're going to be doing, right? The stories that are out there. 
Uh, and then uh, we also set aside um, $750,000 for our grants office because we there is a lot of federal funding that is still available that the state can apply for and get their fair share and bring that back to Arizona so we can keep expanding these programs in Arizona or around workforce. And then the last piece, sorry, Gary, the last piece that's in there too is, and we'll get into this, is, is from a policy perspective, what are the some of the some of the policy barriers or some of the opportunities that uh, we could look at to expand uh, access to to these programs in the state. And um, <clears throat> the goal is to uh, double the number of uh, construction trade apprenticeships by twenty twenty six. That's correct. And, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. And. Where are we at right now? How many apprenticeships do we have statewide? Uh, apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs, I should say. Yeah, De Dennis can correct me here because he's on he's on on that task force. But we have uh, about four thousand uh, uh, apprentices registered right now in, in uh, construction. And I believe there's I believe there is two hundred and thirty four programs. Yep. Uh, okay. Some something like two hundred thirty four, two hundred thirty five programs, and it's over four thousand. <clears throat> apprentices all right so um would the goal be to <clears throat> excuse me create more programs or just get more people into those existing programs i think it's, it's me my personal perspective and my understanding i think it's both but we have a lot of very strong robust programs um the plumbers and pipe fitters, the uh, electrical programs, uh, AGC, um, uh, sheet metal workers, you know, pretty much all of the trades, uh, um, Arizona heavy equipment operators, they all have really robust programs that have been around for over 50, 60 years. And they have the capacity uh, to expand um, I might be off of my numbers here a little bit, but I mean, over the past two to three years, uh, Sean Hutchinson has doubled his numbers to where they're running around 900, a little over 900 apprentices now. I believe the pipe fitters have about 1,200 apprentices. And they the, those programs all have the capacity to go up more, uh, but these grant dollars are what's really going to drive that because they need more space, they need more labs, they need more teachers. Um, but also along with that, I think that there are other industries that we have the ability to create and develop new apprenticeships, uh, such as chip manufacturing plants. There are, there are workers in there that could probably be trained in one to two year apprenticeships, and the companies would gain the benefit of those apprenticeships, uh, some of which is, you know, your training is you know, potentially done on your own time. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's just a lot of benefits of having that skilled workforce and a credential that is provided that is, uh, transportable across the country. Uh, so there's some opportunity there in several industries. We've seen growth in the culinary arts. We've seen growth in the, uh, you know, personal care. Uh, again, we used to have barber apprenticeships here. We didn't have them for 40 years. Now they're back. Um, you know, there's just a lot of industries that are looking now and saying, hey, I think that's a good way and a good model to train people and also provide them with a credential. So there's opportunity for Carlos and his initiative to really help support building some of these newer apprenticeships in new industries, as well as I think your real growth, though, is going to come from these larger programs that have the capacity even to double again in size uh, to meet the need. So what are some of the, um, and I, I guess either Carlos or, or Dennis can answer this, um, what are some of the largest or most popular programs? And what, I guess, what makes them popular? The, there's a lot of interest now in the electrical uh, trades and the plumbing and pipe fitting trade, sheet metal as well. Uh, you can see all the road construction. So the heavy highway programs and the heavy equipment programs are quite popular. Utility programs such as the one I run, they are always very popular. There are line colleges across the country that we recruit from. 
Uh, guys get out of high school and pay their own tuition to a line college to prepare for a pre-apprenticeship. Most utilities run robust pre-apprentice programs or uh, in order to, you have to complete those in order to get into the apprenticeship. Uh, the utility apprenticeships, uh, the pay is very good. The benefits are very good. You also have the benefit of working for one employer, uh, you know, the whole time. So everything goes through that one employer. Um, so, uh, for instance, you know, I'm gonna, I've, I have 30 positions posted now for my next pre-apprentice class. We'll probably get about 500 applications for those 30 positions. And then we have a very robust, uh, written testing and physical testing process that they have to go through. So, you know, a lot of these programs are very popular with, with folks, word of mouth, family, uh, we all do a lot of career fairs, a lot of recruiting, things like that. So uh, we recruit heavily out of those line colleges. Uh, we support uh, Yavapai Line College uh, up in Prescott, uh, which is a fine, fine institution. They turn out a lot of really good, uh, really good guys there. I might add one of their graduates that went into our program and served his apprenticeship uh, when he was an apprentice in 2019. He was the number one apprentice uh, contestant in the world at the international lineman rodeo. Uh, so we're very proud of him. And we just had another guy come up that came through our program, also a product. Uh, and he was just in October was the number two international contestant apprentice. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of it and, and the work is fun as well. The work, there is a lot of fun in this work. We enjoy doing the work. I still enjoy doing electrical work. You know, I do it here at home or, or, uh, I love helping my instructors with a couple of classes there that, you know, that I just have a passion for and enjoy. Uh, the work is fun. It's challenging. It's good work. Um, so I think there's a lot of interest that way as well. Now, <clears throat> this is about apprenticeships, but um, just speak real quickly, you know, um, about the line colleges and what, what they learn there and how long they got to go. So they, they kind of, uh, they all have different formats. Like Yavapai is a two semester program. Uh, although I, I understand they are looking at restructuring it, but, uh, to a one semester and, and more time, but right now there's a two semester, a lot of the line colleges like Northwest line college and, uh, uh, Bismarck line colleges, they are 16 week programs where you go, you actually live there on campus and you do classroom training and field training. They teach you how to climb. They teach you how to build line construction. Uh, they do a little substation work. They do, uh, some metering training. They give you a pretty just well-rounded view of, uh, of utility, uh, work. Uh, they're 16 weeks. They're fairly expensive. You usually live either on the campus or around the campus and you have to make your own arrangements. Uh, those that are, you know, in that format, they are kind of expensive. Uh, Yavapai is regular community college uh, tuition, uh, although you would have to live up in that area, you know, to attend school during that time. Uh, it is a little more of an affordable option, especially for Arizona residents. So, and I'm very high on that program. It's a, it's a great program that they built from scratch up there. I, I think Gary, I think one of the, the strengths of, of this model is also it's industry standards, industry defined, right? So there is a direct pipeline to what an employer needs, which has always been a bit of a struggle with uh, in, in education in terms of, you know, is people going to have, are, are the graduates going to have the right skills to do the job, right? And this, because it is uh, industry defined, uh, that it, it just has that direct pipeline and it's very flexible. So you'll see all sorts of of different models uh, that, that emerge. Uh, uh, to Dennis's point, I mean, the other area we're looking at right now is cybersecurity, right? If you just kind of look at, uh, Entry level jobs in cybersecurity uh, uh, is that's that's a that's a big area of opportunity that that we're also uh, exploring uh, uh, with with partners. 
So uh, an apprenticeship cyber security? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, sorry to cut you off, Sean. Go ahead. Gary, I wanted to oh. uh, correct some figures that we had before. I found I was looking for my last meeting from the state, my notes from the last state meeting. Okay. We currently have, uh, well, this was as of a couple of weeks ago. We have 6,683 current registered apprentices in the state of Arizona. We have 264 programs. There are 812 women uh, that are registered apprentices in the state and 353 veterans. Um, all the programs are trying to do a lot more work. We have been for years and we're, we're seeing some success now, but we are seeing more women and we have several programs to attract veterans uh, coming out of the service through, I know Sean Hutchinson is very involved with SkillBridge and we also have the VEEP program, the IBW VEEP program, helmets to hard hats. Uh, veterans make very good apprentices. They've already, you know, they have a lot of life skills and experience. Uh, and we try to recruit heavily uh, from the veteran community. The other benefit to veterans is we are all registered with the Veterans Administration, all registered apprenticeships. And veterans can use their Montgomery GI Bill benefits uh, and draw those benefits during their apprenticeship program to help pay for any expenses or just living expenses. So kind of wanted to throw that out there too and also correct those figures. Okay, well, appreciate that. And um, yeah, that that's a pretty robust uh, figure there. So um, Sean, take us through um, the life of an apprentice from when they start to they graduate. Uh, yeah, thanks. That's at that least in your program. Uh, yeah, well, I think uh, a lot of programs, uh, you know, they they obviously approach uh, uh, apprenticeship a little bit differently and how they enter apprentices. We're one of the more popular programs. Uh, we there is a process. This is not something that, you know, um, a kid can, you know, just decide I'm going to go down and sign up and and start doing it. There is an, a pretty vigorous application process that they need to do they need to go fill out an application at you know, we do it online so they do an online application uh they um they they are tested their aptitude is tested in in math language and reading skills um and then they uh they sit for a formal interview with our with our governing committee and um answer questions about why they should be selected for this program and um, while it is a, you know, a popular program, we get a lot more applicants than we have um, positions open for a lot of times. So, you know, they're, you know, quite frankly, lately, most people don't get selected uh, on their initial attempt at getting in. So it, sometimes it takes a little bit of a little bit of patience to uh, to get your career started at this at this level. We um, you know, we we do a lot of recruitment uh, activity with you know high schools and CTE programs within the state. Um, we've been uh, leaning uh, heavily lately on a, a new program we've been piloting with uh, Grand Canyon University, where um, you know because we're we're kind of limited with our our recruitment staffing. You know, we we don't have a big administrative staff. We don't have you know the recruitment tools necessary to really get the word out about what an apprenticeship is to the community. So. Uh, we're kind of leaning on our partner with Grand Canyon University right now in their pre-apprenticeship program, uh, which is which has been very very useful not just on the recruitment side, but these you know these young men and women that are coming into this program today, um, they're they're coming from backgrounds of retail and maybe some other part-time work or maybe not even maybe this is their first job, and adulting is is a, is a you know using it as a verb um, is 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 needed um, when you get started here you you're called upon to be um, present for work you know your your um, your attendance at work is is absolutely mandatory you know, there's overtime requirements that uh, need to be fulfilled um, you know the you know so you're taking and I call them kids they're you know in their late teens early 20s but uh, they're going they're maturing very very quickly and getting into this really adult career of you know, a, a, quite frankly, a hazardous occupation and being in construction and uh, being on, you know, a construction site. You know, and it, it's a transition. And you know, our our partners over at GCU have been really um, 
really strategic in, in crafting their curriculum, not so much to teach on the trade. They leave that to the apprenticeship programs uh, for the, you know, for the actual going into the weeds of, uh, of, of learning the science of a trade. Uh, but they go into that preparatory kind of work and uh, and put them through a college accredited semester uh, at, a, at a you know at a university, and it really kind of gives the parents of these kids you know the the comfort knowing that they're getting their kids started with a university uh, experience and then transitioning into their you know their apprenticeship and um, you know so far you know we're we're about a year and a half in and uh, we we definitely notice a difference um, in that in that preparation so it's been a good experience and, and it's pretty com competitive to get into these programs right I mean um, Dennis just I don't recall the numbers you said I think you said you you had many many more applications than than positions or spots and um, just how competitive is it to get in? Well, for, for ours, it's, you know, it's become more and more competitive, the more popular it's become. Um, our, you know, this year we'll probably see over 1500 applications for the year 2023. And uh, we accepted into the program uh, a little over 600 during 2023. And then, uh, we're expecting to uh, have larger classes coming in for 2024, but, you know, about 50% of them are not getting selected. So any advantage that you could give yourself while making, you know, while submitting an application to a program, um, you know, by serving a pre-apprenticeship or having, you know, some, you know, we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're really looking for, for, you know, young, young men and women, or, you know, I shouldn't say young men and women, we got, we got apprentices that are uh, on their second and third careers and in their fifties. Um, we're looking for people that really want to be an apprentice and really have this uh, career uh, in mind and not just, uh, you know, dabbling, if you will, into, uh, you know, what they might be interested in. We're looking for people who are, who are really making that decision. Yes, I want to be an electrician. I want to do it the rest of my life. And, and, and that's really what the competitiveness has become. And really they, the, the only limiting factor to the, you know, to our, us growing even larger um, and doubling our, our numbers is really the opportunities for employment for these apprentices. And that, you know, while you mentioned, you know, at the start of this, you, you notice construction sites everywhere, you notice the buildings downtown Phoenix, you, you know, a lot of cranes in the air, those don't always um, uh, equate to um, apprentice positions. Not a lot of contractors, in fact, probably the majority of contractors right now are not utilizing apprenticeship programs to bring up their workforce. Um, you know, we, we have dozens of employers through, through our sponsors in Arizona NECA and the IBW. But, um, you know, when you look around the town and, and look at construction overall, I would, I would bet a lot of money that, that most of that construction is being done without utilizing apprentices. And apprenticeship is about having a job in the industry it's not just about going down to a training center and learning a, learning a craft uh by a 10 to 1 uh 10 to 1 margin uh they spend for every 10 hours of work they're in hour they're in uh, formal classroom training one hour i i would add to sean's comments too that there there probably is a lot of contractors out there not utilizing the apprenticeship model um and and the the tragedy of that is is that you, you are not creating a sustainable quality uh, workforce for the future. And that's what apprenticeship does. It is a sustainable uh, model to create a qualified workforce for the future. Uh, some of these places, they just go up, they go down, they hire who they need. They have, you know, they'll run them with a, a handful of people that are qualified and then they just hire, you know, basically laborers to go around and those guys move from job to job. That's not good for those guys at the lower end of the spectrum because they never end up really moving up in the industry or it takes a lot longer to move up in the industry where apprenticeship definitely accelerates that and creates, uh, creates that sustainability for the company and the employee. Uh, and I just kind of wanted to add that to Sean's comments because I think that's the real benefit of apprenticeship right there. And I was, I was about to, one of the questions I was going to ask you 
was coming from the audience, and I think you answered it. Um, how does apprenticeship benefit employers and industries coming into Arizona? Um, so, uh, anything to add? What what you just said there, or, or you know, um, like I said, I think you may have answered that with with your answer there. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I, go ahead. Sorry. If 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 you look at you know, for example, take the the semiconductor companies, right, that are making you know significant large investments, probably the most in the world that going on right now in Arizona, Maricopa County, right. Um, having come from that industry, right, that there you have to make decisions. You're competing against the rest of the world in terms of where that facility is going to go, uh, and uh, having. Uh, labor, uh, construction labor skills is definitely a factor, right? Uh, and so it, there's a relationship between economic development and, and skills and workers and workforce that one feeds the other, right? And uh, the, we're trying to maintain that momentum by doing these types of initiatives where uh, an industry can say, I know I can move to Arizona because I know there's going to be talent for me to be successful there. And and construction, like I said before, is kind of like the first entry point, right, for, for these companies. And so that's going to be one of the first things that they access is, do I have enough, uh, is there enough construction workers in, in, in order for me to do, to invest here? Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dennis, to cut you off. No, it's, it's okay. Comments were were exactly right. They were they were spot on. I mean, they, even in the even in the uh, utility industry, we've ramped up our apprenticeship programs to the numbers that we can. Obviously, our numbers are not as big because each company has to employ the number of apprentices we have. So we look for our, you know, to fill our attrition model and to expand a bit. But the utilities also create and maintain uh, that infrastructure for all this building. If you look at all of the uh, substations that have been built to support uh, TSMC, the Intel projects and all that, there's a lot of utility infrastructure goes on that our folks and our line uh, contract uh, contractor folks build and maintain to support that. And Carlos's comments were spot on. Uh, these companies are going to come and relocate their businesses and expand their current businesses in a location where they know that they are guaranteed skilled labor uh, to meet their needs and demands. Don, what's what's the average day for a apprentice like? Because they have to go work on the job site and go to school. So um, is it a 22 hour day or or how do they break it up? I think I was heading that way when I got to, I distracted myself with my comments. Um, so once they're selected for the program, uh, they, they they get a job on day one. They, day one of their apprenticeship, they're assigned to one of our sponsoring employers. Uh, so they get a they get a job, uh, um, a full time job in construction. They they're on a construction site, um, you know, working full time, and the school is on a part time basis. Uh, a lot of the schools do it differently. Uh, I think the the most popular model is is evening classes once or twice a week. And our classes aren't necessarily um, traditional, you know, lecture and, you know, sitting at a desk with notebooks and whatnot. We, we put tools in their hands. We're, we're teaching actual skills in the classroom as they're learning the science and theory of, of whatever the trade is. So, um, but it's a four-year process. Um, ours is a union program, so it's sponsored by the union. And uh, so the wages and benefits are in writing. Um, they know what to expect. They know when they get a raise. They know the the milestones and the thresholds they need to meet uh, to get where they need to go. And it's a defined path to uh, to getting the uh, the credential that they are getting, which is a state certificate um, signed by the governor um, that they complete and the secretary of state uh, that they that they completed a, an apprenticeship and that is recognized nationwide alongside their IBW ticket that now um, reflects journeyman inside wireman. Uh, for our program. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, the, the going through the program, it is definitely a long process. It's, it's not easy um, by any means. And, uh, but it, it does lead to uh, success and, um, and just, it, it is really, you know, the, 
the, the, we have a lot of issues in construction today and the qualified workforce, um, we're looking at retirements, we're looking at attrition um, between the, those two factors. Um, really, the only way out of this is to train our way out of this and uh, to use, utilize these apprenticeship programs and really invest in them to get us to where we need to be to have a dependable uh, workforce for the future. Because these all these industries and these emerging companies that are moving their operations to Arizona, if we can't build their buildings to their specifications and to the quality they expect, um, it, we are going to fail as, as a state overall. This, these are programs really have a significant impact on the success of the state moving forward. So um, w what's the first steps for a, you know, a person that's looking for a program and, and, you know, what should they look for in comparing programs? Well, uh, you know, the, the state uh, DES website, the, um, the the state office of apprenticeship has uh, a lot of good resources about what programs are out there. Um, just, you know, d just doing an Internet search. Uh, I think a lot of our candidates are actually finding us. Uh, the majority is switching over to, uh, you know, finding us on the Internet. But a lot of uh, programs have their own websites and information. You know, we try and pack as much information as we can about the program and ours. Um, but the uh, uh, you know get, get, you know finding their their passion in, in construction is really what they need to define that themselves. And once they know what they want to do, um, you know to, to make themselves a good candidate, they really you know it, they most of these programs have a formal interview process. They need to convince those interviewers that this is what they want to do. Um, if they are convinced of that, they'll they'll move forward and they'll they'll have to prove that and as they move forward. But uh, you know, the, the best quality candidates, I would say, um, you know, show a, a background of mechanical aptitude um, in what they discuss with us. You know, when I hear them uh, talking in a in an interview process about how they wrenched on their car or how they uh, you know they took apart their transmission and uh, fix it themselves. You know, we we like hearing stories of that um, because it it just shows that you know they have they have that kind of um, that kind of, kind of background and interest in in turning a wrench and and building things. So that's uh, that's a real helpful uh, a helpful hint to anyone that's uh, advising uh, future apprentices about what we look for: um, good grades and good uh, responsible attendance and military background and you know you name it. You know the the you know the the, the the backgrounds of people, you know, we that's a part that's a big part of the um the formula. Yeah, and I think it's sorry, Darren. I, I see like a, a lot of questions about CTE and K twelve and and, so, and and I think that's kind of a, a big portion of what you talked about in terms of how to how do students make decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh and so formalizing relationships there like uh what Sean talked about with GCU, right? Formalizing those types of pathways for students with uh, the CTE programs are in the, all over the state, right? Around the opportunities that are available for them so they can make good decisions, right? In terms of what what am I really passionate about and what, you know, and get some tools in their hands like Sean talked about. And do I really want to turn a wrench or do I want to be over here welding stuff, right? Uh, and so I, I think there's... Um, Lots of lots of opportunity there for us to just uh, expand the uh, the access to these programs and get a, a bigger pool of of students uh, for these programs. Thank you, Carlos. And um, I'm going to take a question from the audience here. And um, can you talk a, a little bit about job safety and trade safety programs as they impact apprentices? Well, obviously, a big part of our education, especially out the gate, uh, surrounds OSHA OSHA standards, uh, OSHA ten class uh, for all of our uh, for all of our candidates. Uh, you know, we uh, because it's electrical trade, we do a lot of uh, we do. You know, they, they have to learn CPR and first aid, and um, they you know they learn it as it applies to electricians. Um, you know, as it is one of the more hazardous occupations of all the building trades. Um, and yeah, we, we do, I mean, all of the training that they receive really revolves around a safety component. Um, and, you know, OSHA standards require that, you know, that, that, that their employer is provide is required to provide a safe and helpful work for work site. 
um, which, uh, you know, for someone, uh, someone just starting in the trade might look a little different when they enter a job site and see cranes and, you know, you know, all kinds of stuff flying through the air. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, you know, if it's your first if job site and it's a, you know, it's a, it's an active new construction site, it's not going to have that comfortable feeling, but, uh, but, but yeah, we do a, a heck of a lot of um, uh, safety training uh, throughout the program, uh, recognizing hazards and, um, and working with the employers to make sure they uh, remain safe throughout. Um, but, but to, um, uh, to Carlos's point about the, the CTE's role in generating that interest, uh, you know, the, the CTE program participants, uh, we notice uh, a big difference in them as well when they come to apply. You know, they are very well prepared from our state CTE programs to, to enter a trade even soon after high school. Um, you know, because those candidates, you really got to be careful with because uh, they, I mean, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do right out of high school and wanted to be a TV weatherman. Uh, so it's uh, kind of a weird thing. But, um, but yeah, you know, my dad was an electrician, so I, uh, he was also a member of the IBW. So I, I didn't want to be like that initially, but uh, eventually uh, took the took the right path. I've been thanking him ever since. But, but yeah, that, thanks for that, though. Thank you, Mike, and or Sean, I'm sorry. And um, so yesterday uh, when we were talking, um, Sean and, and Dennis, you both kind of um, laughed about being wonky. Um, here's a wonky question. And, um, you know, what, what can the state legislature do to, to help with the apprenticeship programs, you know, in terms of maybe funding, cutting red tape, um, what, you know, is there anything coming down the pipe, you know, next session that uh, you guys might be excited about or um, fearful of? Fearful. Um, no, uh, you know, the, look, there, there is, there is, um, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the only restrictive um, the only restriction that we have for growing our program is the opportunities for employment for apprentices. Um, apprenticeship is is not um, a shortcut. It's not cheap, and it's not it's not an easy path, and it's not a desirable path for some some employers. And that's uh, and and when that reflects in the you know because this is a very competitive industry, uh, which uh, you know with a transient workforce, you're you're looking at a lot of different pieces of this puzzle that, that could come under better policy about, about, you know, the, the requirement of using apprentices in construction. You know, we, we, we have a, um, we have very little to no regulation and where apprentices are required to be used. You know, if, a, if, um, you know, if we're not making that a requirement on bid day for a competitive contract in construction, um, you know, Training is one of the easiest ones to uh, to, to fall back on. So, look, it, we need to we need the state to recognize that the importance of supporting apprenticeship programs, union or non-union, you know, it, uh, you know, it's it really is a matter of supporting apprenticeship programs. And the way you do that is not is less about throwing money at the programs and more about making sure that job sites are are are. All job sites that, that are out there right now today should have apprentices learning the trade in a registered apprenticeship program. Not these, not these will make you a, an electrician in six month trade school programs. We need uh, registered programs to be supported by uh, good public policy that that really requires the use of apprentices um, in, in growing and, and maintaining a skilled workforce for the future. So I want to, I'm going to climb up on my soapbox again a little bit, get a little wonky, but the law in Arizona uh, creating apprenticeship expired 30 years ago, and we've never got it renewed. We have been operating under uh, essentially executive order after executive order uh, every four years. And that's really, frankly, where we are now and where Arizona is in the economy of the United States. That is unacceptable. Uh, our our previous apprenticeship uh, uh, lead at the Office of Apprenticeship, uh, William Higgins, he spent 10 years of his life trying to get that law renewed uh, to no avail. 
Uh, we need some action taken. We need that bill taken up and rewritten, creating apprenticeship again in the state of Arizona. And uh, we need the support of the legislature and the executive office to really fully support apprenticeship. I am very encouraged by the recent administration and their support of the apprenticeship community. Uh, and I think that, that they're going to be able to get that done. But we need the legislature's help, too. And we need for them to, to pick this bill up, get it written, and get it passed, creating apprenticeship again. It's Again, I'm going to say, it is unacceptable that we've been operating for 30 years uh, without a state uh, law creating apprenticeship in this state. What, what's been the, uh, uh, I guess, the opposition or the, the holdup, the, the brick wall to it? Lack of interest. Yeah, I, I don't think of, uh, anybody's opposed to it, Gary. I think it's just been a lack of interest. And a lot of these programs, uh, the registered apprenticeship programs, they have been, they have sustained this effort uh, for, you know, and, and self-supported actually funding and everything, you know, for the last 30 years with no help from anyone. And now we finally feel like we've got the opportunity to get some help. And that that honestly was not acceptable. It wasn't acceptable then. It's not acceptable now. But I think it was just a lack of interest. And now that we need all these, we need apprenticeship to double. We need all these apprentices and all this workforce. And everybody's saying, well, why don't we have them? Well, that lack of support over the last 30 years has created this situation. And now it's time to get busy and really support it. You get the fear of regulation as well in any industry. They, you know, private sector in particular gets very fearful when you use the word regulate. Um, you know, another way to uh, really get to another level of dependency on a on a on a ready workforce is is using utilizing state licensing. The individual worker, uh, not just one licensed uh, individual in a company and four hundred people that are under that one license. That. That is totally unacceptable um, when it comes to the safety of any installation. If you're utilizing, you know, quite frankly, less than qualified labor to to wire your say your house where your kids sleep or your business um, uh, where you go to work every day, uh, people less than qualified wiring these uh, these places uh, can lead to disaster. And uh, quite frankly, the the state um, has ignored this because. Um, Quite frankly, they don't like regulation here, and um, and none of the um, state agencies want to house a, uh, a you know a licensed program. And there's been no no appetite in the legislature either to ever take up a licensing bill that we've tried multiple times over the last several years to 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 get um, uh, to get some interest in. So uh, that's 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 a couple of things that we can do. Um, to to really promote uh, to really promote apprenticeship, not just not just say we we like it. Um, we need to do things um, actively within good policy uh, to uh, to really uh, do something meaningful for apprenticeship training. All right, gentlemen, we're down to our last minute, and that just gives me enough time to thank our audience. Um, thank uh, each of you, Sean Hutchinson. Dennis Anthony and Carlos Contreras um, for joining us this morning. And uh, also want to thank our sponsor, Powering Arizona. And um, I think I misspoke earlier, I, or I did not mention them earlier, and I apologize for that. So um, anyway, have a great day, everybody. And thank you for, uh, for coming. Tomorrow we have another morning scoop if you're interested on elections. So um, if you're looking for a little... Uh, action and and uh that'll be the place so thank you very much and have a good day thank you gary thank you, thank you. bye